Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the Stockbridge Library Museum and Archives program tonight on Winter Birds of the Berkshires. My name is Wendy Pearson and I'm the director at the library. I'm very happy to have all of you with us and very delighted and honored to have with us Laura Beltran, who will be talking with us this evening about some of the common birds that inhabit the Berkshires in the winter. And we'll be learning how to identify the birds, learning a little bit about where to find them and what behavior at, um, birds exhibit in cold temperatures. A little bit about Laura before we begin. Laura has degrees in environmental biology from St. Lawrence University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And for over three decades, she has been interpreting natural history in the Northeast, the Southeast, and in the Midwest. She was the education coordinator for public programs at Mass Audubon's Pleasant Valley Sanctuary for seven years and is currently a teacher naturalist at Mass Audubon's Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary in East Hampton, where she has been for the past eight years. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to turn the program over to you. Great, thank you. Yeah, what a great intro. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here this evening. And again, I'm going to be covering uh, birds in winter. As we go through, I'll be talking about different things uh, like migration, choices birds make, uh, where they migrate to, why they migrate. And as we go along, if anyone has any questions, I don't know, Wendy, if you want them to put that in the chat or if you'd like them just to unmute and ask the question, either way is fine with me. So um, not... I think, while we're going on um, through your presentation in the chat would be great. Okay. Um, and I, I would like to mention it's best, I think for the program, if when you're not speaking, if you can mute your microphones, our audience, please. And you can put questions in the chat and we will have a time for question and answers at the end. Perfect, great. And then uh, I'm gonna share my screen. So if I have she screen sharing ability, I'm not sure if I have mm -hmm. that yet. Yeah. All set. Okay, great. All right, is that coming up? No, all right, let me um, go back then, hold on. Hmm. Hi. Not sure. I think I'm going to have to come and connect back in again. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Let me see here. Yeah, all right. Let's try this one more time. There, that's better. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Let me just minimize everyone else here so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, here we go. Birds in winter. I'm excited to uh, tell you all about birds in winter. Birds are some of my favorite animals. Um, I've been bird watching since I was a child. When I was really young, what I did was I, um, my dad had a woodworking shop in the basement and I decided to build something. And the only thing I could think of since I read Ranger Rick from National Wildlife Federation was um, a bird feeder. And so I built a bird feeder, a very, uh, wobbly one and I actually nailed it to the side of my house which my parents were very tolerant about and they just bought bird seed having no idea and um, that how many birds there would be and we were amazed and ever since then uh, I have been what I consider a birder uh, just very enthusiastic about learning lots and lots about birds. As I go through the presentation you'll notice that they all have different photographs of birds a lot of these photos were taken um, by a prior educator with Mass Audubon. Um, so I am not a photographer. Uh, and so if any of you are photographers in the audience, I apologize because I, I can't give you any uh, advice on that. But what I did with each photo is I did in the lower left corner, you'll notice of each photos, I did put what bird species it is. So if you have any questions about identification, you can put those in the chat. 
and we can talk about um, that those bird species. So just an overview. Um, I'll be talking. I'll be talking about birds' choices uh, in this season of winter, how they overwinter, uh, some of the birds that do overwinter, and how we know that, and bird feeding. Um, and if you look at this downy woodpecker, you can see um, you can't see its head, but if you look overall. I just wanted to point out that we have two different woodpeckers. So if any of you are familiar with um, your bird feeder birds, you know that there's the hairy woodpecker, which looks almost identical except larger to the downy woodpecker. And so I wanted to point out something to notice in this photo are these tiny little dots along the edge of this white on its tail. Downy woodpeckers have those little dots and hairy woodpeckers do not. So when you get really good at telling the difference between the two, you can look for that. Underneath, if we were looking at the opposite side of the tail, you would actually see uh, black stripes going across um, the downy woodpecker's tail. And again, none on the hairy woodpecker. So I just wanted to point that out, which is a fun thing to know in identification. So choices in the wintertime, birds have to, they're adapted to, making the choice of what to do in this hardest season, season of the year. They can stay in one place or uh, choose to move a short distance, migrate a long distance, or they wander about. And the whole point of migration is that they have to find food. So winter is a challenge because it's cold. First of all, we have stronger storms, so it becomes a shelter problem. Of course, there's a lot less food because our insects are um, in hibernation or, or they've some of the insects even migrate. They're underground, hard to find. And uh, less seeds, seeds may be buried in the snow. And so, you know, animals have to adapt to what is this season gonna bring? Also, I wanna say that winter with its shorter day length, the shorter day length makes it less for these animals like our songbirds, which are diurnal, meaning they're active in the daytime, there are less hours during the day that they can forage for food. And they need more food, but yet they have less time to forage for food during this season. So they have to make some sort of choice as to what they're going to do. Challenges of leaving in migration, you can see there are many. Long distance migration, is a thousand miles is considered a thousand miles or more, and then short distance would be anything less than that. This American red start is a bird that is a long distance migrant, so it it does breed around here in in the Berkshires and where I am in the Connecticut Valley, so Western Mass, and then it flies down to South America, and. So it goes through this process of having to go through all these obstacles. If you think about the obstacles would be things like large storms. It could be that the bird arrives in its wintering ground and the habitat has completely changed. There are some birds that overwinter along coasts and if there's been a hurricane or um, any big storm, it could have completely changed the coastline. So there could be an obstacle in that sense. Um, other obstacles could be predators, uh, hawks. Um, an obstacle could be competition with other birds. The local birds down in the um, southern hemisphere is that could be an obstacle. Um, during migration, of course, um, they have to um, know how to navigate, and we don't quite understand thoroughly how birds navigate. It's complicated. And there's been some study that of quantum phys physics that has to do with navigation and migration of birds. So yes, they do use stars. They use the magnetic um, poles. And somehow they do this. The birds are born up north, and then they navigate south. And uh, it's really kind of an amazing feat. They also have to constantly refuel. So you think about birds. They're, they have high, high metabolism. So they have to eat almost all the time and it is risky. So it's, it's a lot to ask for a bird to migrate or for a bird to be adapted to migrating. 
So what is migrate, migration? What are the benefits and when? Um, so of course, migration, it's the movement, a large movement of animals from one location to another. This is a map of some songbirds that, my, that breed up in um, Northern Canada, and then they go down uh, to South America or to uh, the Caribbean and Central America. And the reason I wanted to show you this map about migration is the importance of different ecosystems, especially in North America, the boreal ecosystem. So that whole Northern uh, range of North America where it would be forests of spruce trees and balsam fir trees, which would eventually, as you go further north, um, would turn into what's called taiga, which is kind of these wetlands, shrubby areas, and then eventually into the tundra, and how significant those habitats are for so many of our birds for breeding. And then those birds will leave and go into uh, the tropical forest, the tropical rainforest, and how significant that is for wintering grounds. Would like to say, you know, this of course is a map showing only one direction of um, the southern, our birds that breed up north and they will go to the south. There are birds that do the opposite, where they will actually breed in South America and then come north to North America for a winter. What would be our summer, but for the bird would be their winter. Um, and so, you know, we all often think of the um, migration in, in this direction just because of where we live. But I wanted to mention that migration is in many different, um, different directions. Also, there are birds that will breed in the Alaska area and will migrate to the off the coast of Massachusetts. And so it's more of an east-west migration. So that can happen as well. Of course, there's all the migration that happens in Eurasia as well, which I, you know, I, I didn't show a map here of that. And when birds migrate, so each bird species migrates at a particular time for when they're adapted. This is a migration pattern of the yellow warbler. I'm going to go back. This is the yellow warbler. And I just want to point out a couple features about this bird. It's um, a bird of maybe about four inches long, four or five inches long. It has this thin, thin bill. And so this bird is adapted to eating insects. And what this bird does is it comes to areas where the buds are just opening. As you can see on this shrub, this, uh, I think it's red osier dogwood that this uh, yellow warbler is sitting on. And when these buds open, or are just about to open is when you can get the insects that have been overwintering in these buds to eat. And it uses that needle-like bill to probe into and around all those buds. And so its timing is about the second week in May in the Berkshires when you'll see um, a whole influx of yellow warblers, excuse me, um, because that's when the shrubs and the trees are just starting, the shrubs are swelling, or the buds are swelling, and the um, buds are about to burst open. And like I said, there's thousands, thousands of these tiny little insects, and that's where they will be, is right inside those little buds. So, um, so this is just an example of one bird. There are other birds, for example, um, hawks. Many hawks will migrate in mid-March. Red-winged blackbirds typically start to arrive back the first week in February. And so as a bird watcher, you learn these patterns and that's called phenology, is the timing of when things occur in nature. And of course, our biggest challenge now, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, is when um, certain plants are starting to flower, when buds are starting to open, when insects are starting to breed or their eggs starting to hatch, the timing is getting to be different with climate change and birds, are they adapting fast enough to uh, be able to time when they arrive on their breeding grounds or, their, or during migration? 
to get the food that they need. So there are some benefits of leaving the uh, breeding ground, even though long distance or even short distance migration is, is risky, the benefits outweigh those costs. And the benefits are that once you get to the tropics along the equator or south of the equator when it's um, warmer down there, the amount of food resources is far more than they could find in uh, North America, like this Blackburnian warbler. Also, of course, the weather will be much more mild and the winters are much easier. And there's, uh, like I said, tons and tons of food. And so that is what drives these birds to breed where we are or north, further north, and then to make this long distance uh, migration. It's all about food resources and not having to deal with cold weather. So who migrates? About two thirds of the bird species migrate in North America. And so it covers almost every group of birds. And again, those who do not migrate also are all in these types of groups, which we'll go through. I'll go through some of those that you'll expect to see in the wintertime. So there are songbirds that migrate, ducks and geese migrate, um, birds of prey like hawks and falcons and um, vultures like this in this picture, they mig migrate and water birds would be things like egrets and great blue herons. And again, it's all about finding where the food is. But there are also, if birds don't migrate and they don't go through that high risk, there is a risk of staying. Uh, there's unreliable food sources and that what, you know, there's a lot less insects available. Or if you're like this duck, if the water freezes, you can't reach your food. You've got to move somewhere else. And so there it takes energy to wander about to find where the food will be. One of the biggest challenges for birds is they are endothermic, meaning they're warm blooded. So they have a very high body temperature. If you have a high body temperature as an animal, you have to maintain that temperature by eating lots and lots of food for energy. It's not like, I mean, they're like us. We have to eat every day in order to maintain our metabolism and same with birds. And so uh, if, you know, they, they can't be like a reptile and go for weeks or even months without eating. And so that is, what is a challenge for them during the winter time is that they have to get extra amounts of food because they're burning off more energy, trying to stay warm and maintain a regular body temperature. There are some benefits to staying though, which for the one third of birds that do stay um, is enough for them to do that. They will have the first choice on the breeding grounds. They don't have to spend that time migrating. They don't arrive and have a t competition with territory with other birds already. So their, their territories are continuous. And in the wintertime, it might include a much larger area so that they can find food. But in that within that large area could be, be their breeding territory. And so they already have staked out maybe a good nesting site, um, a hole in a tree, whatever it may be. So that is a real advantage. Um, and birds will store food just like uh, our rodents, like squirrels, which I'll get to in just a bit. So you, you decide to stay, now what? There's different adaptations birds have for, for the winter time. And it has to do with their feathers and the climate, their metabolism, roosting sites, and something called countercurrent exchange. So with their feathers, as we all know, probably from wearing down jackets, you know how warm a feathers can be. And so a bird, for example, chickadee, in the wintertime, 
will actually grow a thousand extra feathers. And with those extra feathers, of course, comes more warmth. We already talked about the high temperature of a bird, their metabolism is high. And if you have a really warm body temperature, the birds will fluff those feathers, get air close right against their body and that air will warm up um, from their body temperature. And then their feathers will cover that air and keep it in like an insulated blanket. Uh, and I'm sure we've all seen this if you have bird feeders or if you've been out birding in the wintertime, especially on a very cold day, you'll see you know, the birds will look like they're little round baseballs or softballs. And it's because they fluff those feathers up to make themselves stay warm. And so that's um, a real adaptation for staying warm in the wintertime. Microclimates, the birds that are resident birds, they will know their territory and that forest area or field or wherever they are really well. And it's like you all knowing your neighborhood. They know where the best, the Southern exposure is, for example. They'll know where the evergreen trees are that provide protection. They'll, they'll know all those uh, smaller climates that are slightly warmer. They'll know where uh, tree holes are. They'll know where nest boxes are and uh, that they'll take advantage of all of that. One, um, one day last winter, I was walking by a bluebird box and um, out peeked ahead, and this was, it must have been January, and out peeked ahead, it was a downy woodpecker. So the downy woodpecker had found the nest by the bluebird box and had gone in to keep itself warm. So they'll, they'll take advantage of, of things like that and they know where those are. We already talked about metabolism, how high their metabolism is. Many birds have what they call um, semi-torpor at nighttime. And so it's almost, the best way to think about it is almost going into a mini hibernation. So a bird will have high metabolism, high temperature, feeding all day long. And then once the uh, sun sets and it gets colder, they'll find their roosting site in a microclimate that's a little warmer. And then they will go into a torpor where their body temperature, their heart rate and their breathing rate goes down significantly. And then they don't have to expend all this energy burning off, um, burning off calories to keep themselves at a very high temperature. And so they can do that every night and help um, conserve energy. The other thing that birds do is that they'll uh, roost together like uh, chickadees will um, get together in groups so that they can stay warm against uh, each other. Counter current, current exchange is something that you'll see in birds that stand on ice, like gulls and ducks. And what happens with countercurrent exchange is the arteries and the veins in their legs are really close together. And so the blood coming from the heart warmed by the body will go down the leg to the foot and as it goes down, it's exposed to below freezing temperatures. Of course, the temperature goes down, as you can see here. And then it will go around the foot, but it hasn't gone, notice it's not below freezing. And then it will go back up through the vein and the temperature will start to increase because the artery is exchanging heat into the vein back into the bird's body. And so this, through this countercurrent, birds are able to stand on ice or be in freezing cold water. And the other thing about birds' feet is they don't have, they just have pretty much just tendons and bones and that's it. So there's not any frostbite. So it's a great adaptation for being on cold ice. Feeding is a really important, how, how birds feed in the wintertime is an adaptation in itself. 
birds that are not particular, in other words, they'll eat insects as well as seeds, as well as berries and being at a bird feeder, they'll explore a whole bunch of different areas in order to find food and different food sources. And so they're not just feeding on one thing. They cache food too. Some birds like chickadees, nuthatches, titmice, blue jays, woodpeckers, many birds will store food, like I mentioned before, like squirrels do. And so um, as you can see here, chickadees, the hippocampus in a chickadee will actually increase 30% in the winter time or in the fall preparing for winter. And that, that's the memory part of the brain. And so that way, when a chickadee takes seed or whatever it's eating and finds a spot to store it, it will remember where it stored it. The interesting thing is that their brains of black-capped chickadees here in Massachusetts, for example, in the wintertime are larger than the brains of black-capped chickadees, let's say down in Virginia where it's warmer. And if you think about that, that makes sense because the other adaptation that birds need to deal with is flight. They have to be light. They have to be able to fly, especially in winter when they're foraging and finding food or if they're in migration. So it's always a balance. How heavy is the bird going to be? How much energy is it gonna take for it to fly? So if there's no pressure for the bird to have to have a larger brain, like in Virginia, it's not gonna get that because that would add weight to the bird. Another example of that is that many birds that breed way far north um, and they're long distance migrants, so they migrate more than a thousand miles. Once they're done breeding, their reproductive organs completely diminish because if you think about that they don't need that anymore when they're going to their wintering grounds. And so that way it lightens up their body weight so that when they fly, they don't have to carry all that extra amount. I have seen um, caching done by, uh, by nut hatches at, from my feeder. What this nut hatch was taking um, sunflower seeds and going to a stone wall in my garden all last winter. So it's kind of fun to watch. If you do have a bird feeder, you can watch sometimes a chickadee or a nut hatch or a titmouse, they'll take one seed and they'll, you've probably seen it before, they'll hold it um, with their um, feet and, and they'll peck away at it and they'll, they might eat it and then they might get another seed. They'll watch them when they get the second seed. And if you can get binoculars and watch where they go, you might find where they've stored some of their food. So we'll go through some species of who stays, just to give you some idea of some of the species that you might see. A Northern Mockingbird is this picture right here. You can tell Mockingbird, they kind of have this little bit down, uh, bill is kind of down curved at the end. Uh, and they have a very, very long tail that has white on the edge. Can't, can't see that here in all gray. They used to not, actually not stay here in the winter time. Now, uh, their range is expanding. And so they are here in the winter time and can find enough food. So that's always an interesting thing is that it's not these uh, lines of where birds are located are not, are always constantly changing. It's kind of a gray area. And it has, has to do with many factors, climate change being one of them, uh, bird feeding, another competition with other birds, many, many different factors. But who stays, you could see this whole list, just like the list of who migrates. It um, includes many of the same groups of birds. So we do oops, have ducks that stay. We have two groups. Ducks can be grouped into two different big groups, dabbling ducks and diving ducks. Dabbling ducks are the ducks that are the kind of like the pond ducks. So they're in shallow water and they tilt themselves up. So their rear end kind of goes up in the air when they're feeding and they're eating, it could be plant material or macro invertebrates, little insects in the pond area. And so they don't do any diving. So the other group of ducks actually dive underwater and search for things like fish and other uh, macro, aquatic macro invertebrates. 
green winged teal. It's one of our um, small ducks. You can see the big black flat bill. That gives you a clue that it's one of these dabbling ducks that just tip up. It has This is a male. And so he has this beautiful rusty head and this green sort of stripe around the eye. And you can see from this photograph how um, thick the feathers are uh, for keeping warm. Ducks also have uh, an oil gland right above their tail. And they will preen their feathers by putting this oil all over the feathers, which, which makes their feathers waterproof. So again, if they're in really freezing cold water, it doesn't absorb through the feathers onto their skin because it's like wearing a rain jacket. Another really common duck that you would probably see like at uh, the Stockbridge Bowl, you could find on the edge of Lake Pontu Pontusic Lake or Anoda Lake, um, Laurel Lake are mallards. And mallards, they're really, really beautiful duck for being such a common duck. If you look at the colors just in this photograph, again, this is a male, the females are brown and speckled and they're beautiful in their own, in a different way. But the male has this beautiful bright yellow bill, again, flat because it's a dabbling duck and it strains water and plant material through its bill. A gr bright green head and this blue, it's called a speculum on the wing. And speculums are a way of identifying ducks. If you look at the color of the speculum, it gives you a big clue as to what duck you might have. The other fun thing about mallards is they have this, these curly cues at the end, which other ducks don't. So it's just another feature, uh, probably for courtship. And then their red feet. Thing about dabbling ducks is if you see them standing, and I'll go back, it's hard to see, but in the background photo, you can see the leg here of the teal is kind of centered on its body. And so they're quite good at walking on land. Um, and so that's something else to look for when you're trying to identify ducks is um, how far back are the legs. Our diving ducks, speaking about legs, are their legs are further back because they need to use those legs to push themselves underwater. And so their legs are not centered underneath their body, they're further back towards the tail. A hooded merganser is one of our smaller ducks. And you can see, look at the shape of the bill, how much different it is because it dives down and grabs fish. And so this is a duck again that you could see all winter long and they will be on swamps. So they like, beaver ponds, for example. So if there's any open water near a beaver pond, you can look um, for hooded mergansers there. They nest in holes in trees. And so that's why they like big stands of dead trees in beaver swamps. And greater scop, that's another diving duck. This is a pretty big diving duck. Scops can also be found on the ocean and bays. And so um, they dive down for, um, for things like mollusks in the ocean, but they'll eat uh, macroinvertebrates and crayfish and things like that. So they, again, they're a diving duck and they, on the bigger lakes in the Berkshires, this is where you can find them. Now, what happens is, of course, if it gets really cold, we get ice on the ponds. And this is when you wanna get your binoculars out and look for a spot that's open because what it does is it creates just this small area where the ducks can actually dive and get to their food or they can tip up and be dabbling and get food. And so it congregates the ducks in the wintertime. And so that can be a, a real treat if you're trying to find um, different ducks to, to see when you're bird watching in the winter. So other groups of birds, there are raptors that do stay and are most common is the red-tailed hawk. The reason red-tailed hawks can stay is they're really great at catching squirrels. Squirrels are active all winter long. They, they'll eat um, mice and voles. Again, they're active in the winter. Rabbits and rabbits are active all winter long. So they have plenty of food to search for. 
the way to identify a red-tailed hawk in this part of our country, red-tailed hawks are all across North America and they come in many color variations. Our color, va color variation in the East Coast, we have this white chest patch and um, streaking right here, like a belly band. And then you notice right here, like, mm, I don't know if you want to call it a, where the shoulders are is a black area. You can't always tell red-tailed hawks by the red tail because a young one won't have a young uh, red tail. It takes a couple of years. And this is just uh, shows some of the great adaptations of hawks. You can see the eyes are straight ahead. Um, there's a saying that says, eyes on the side, born to hide, meaning you're uh, uh, usually a prey uh, item. And then eyes in front, born to hunt, because you're usually the predator. And that's so that the hawk can pinpoint exactly what it's searching for. The other neat thing about the eyes is you, they have sort of this flap above it, it kind of acts like a baseball cap, shades the eye a little bit so that they can see better. Of course, birds of prey have a big hooked bill. Birds don't have teeth. So the only way for it to um, tear apart its prey is by having that hooked bill. Bald eagles, you'll see on any open water, they are mostly fish eating birds of prey. They'll also steal food from other birds, um, especially fish and they will eat a lot of carrion. And so if it's a really harsh winter, sometimes coyotes will chase a deer out onto ice or the deer will run out onto a lake and the ice won't be thick enough and the deer will fall partially through the ice and unfortunately die. And then the bald eagles will come and feed off of the carcass. And so that is um, something that used to happen more when we had a harsher winters, but mentioning that it's just that eagles will take advantage of dead animals. So they will be searching for that. They prefer fish. So if you have any open water along the Housatonic River, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the big lake at the end of the Housatonic River and um, any of the big lakes, if they're open, that's where you'll find eagles. Eagles look like two by fours when they're flying, big, broad, flat wings. And notice how far the head comes out from the shoulders. The white head and tail may not be so obvious. It takes five years for an immature eagle to get to having a full white head and a full white tail. There are different stages. It's all brown and mottly be, uh, before all that. Also notice that its body is dark. Some people mistake osprey, which are another fish eating raptor for eagles. Osprey have white um, on their chest and bellies. We do have owls that are here in the winter time. And what's really interesting about owls is that they start their courtship now. So December, January, and February, this is the time to listen for owls. They start setting up their territory, calling to each other, and really being active at this time of year. And then once they settle down, lay their eggs and incubate their eggs, once their eggs hatch, it times it right when things like rabbits will be having their young and there'll be more mice. And so they can feed the owlets a lot more food. So it's a timing thing, that phenology again. And so that's why they're starting right now in setting up and courting each other and setting up their uh, breeding territories. The barred owl is maybe about, oh, I want to say 15 inches tall. It's an owl that tends to prefer wetland areas like um, beaver swamps and marshy, marshy areas or the edges of marshes. And they're an owl that actually sometimes you see during the day. So they'll be active sometimes at sundown, right at sunset, um, although they'll be active all through the night as well. And you can see they um, get their name because they have the barring that goes horizontal right underneath their chin. And 
um, and then stripes that go down their, their bodies. And they'll feed, they can be here all winter long because they feed on the mice and the voles, small rodents. Even though the rodents, rodents are in what's called the subnivian layer, the owls can hear them. The subnivian layer is the layer right above the ground underneath the snow. And the and mice and voles will actually live in that area. It will tunnel through. And the owls can actually hear them and will can pounce and get them through the snow. Another owl that is here year round is the great horned owl. This is called the tiger of the woods. It's the top predator if you have a great horned owl around. And again, you'll hear them calling this time of year. So they're, they're going through courtship this time of year. And they do, it's hard to tell in this photo, but they have these ear tufts. I mean, not ear tufts, they're um, feather tufts that stick up that make them look like they have horns or ears. Those actually aren't the ears and obvious are not horns, um, but that where, that's where it gets its name. They're called tiger of the woods because they eat pretty much whatever they can catch. They will eat skunks, they have no sense of smell. They'll eat um, rabbits, ducks, other owls. They will eat cats. It's one of the best reasons to keep your cat safe and indoors. Um, so pretty much whatever they can get their, their uh, talons around, they'll, they'll feed on. So very uh, successful in the wintertime. Now I just wanted to go through um, some of feeder birds because I'm sure some of you it, have bird feeders and bird feeders will attract short distance migrants because these short distance migrants, if they don't, they migrate a little bit. If they find a food source, then they're not gonna migrate any further if they don't have to. Um, and also our year round birds. So a short distance migrant is a white-throated sparrow. And so you uh, often they will come and they'll stay um, they might migrate from Mount Greylock down Mount, Mount Greylock just to the lower elevations. So it could be that short a distance, or it might be from Mount Greylock to where I'm living in the Connecticut Valley. Um, or a short distance migrant might be from Southern Canada to here. Blue Jays, very common um, at our feeders. They are a corvid, meaning they're related to crows and ravens. So they're part of the group of birds that are some of the smartest birds. And again, just like the mallard, I know the blue jays are really, really common, but they're extremely beautiful birds. They have, uh, it doesn't show on this photo, but they have a purple patch on their back. And I, I can't really name any other bird around here that has purple on it um, and their stripe around their face. And they're quite clever. So if you can get a few blue jays at your feeder and watch their behavior, it's, it's fun to watch. I had a few blue jays that were coming to my feeder and they would actually um, take turns and they were getting peanuts and they would take as many peanuts as they could and try to stash them somewhere. But then they would take turns and they would call to each other to let each other know when they were done taking their share of the peanuts. It was kind of fun to watch. Woodpeckers, of course, we talked already about our downy woodpecker at the beginning. If you remember, see here the spots at the side. And here's our hairy woodpecker, no spots at the side. I have another photograph of the two of them. So this shows you size difference. So if you're lucky to have them both at the same time at a feeder, you can really see the size difference. But if you can, if you're seeing them up in a tree and you're looking through binoculars, size can be deceiving. So one of the best ways to tell is by looking at the bill. The bill of the downy is about half the length of the head, whereas a hairy woodpecker, the bill is the same length as the head. It's a much bigger bill. And again, if you get a really good look, you can look at the side of the tails. Interestingly, even though they're colored almost exactly the same, they are not closely related. And so scientists are trying to figure out why is there mimicry going on? Like is the downy woodpecker trying to mimic looking like the hairy woodpecker? And if so, what is the advantage of that? Then we don't have the answers to that yet. More woodpeckers, red-bellied woodpecker and pileated woodpeckers would be common to see in the winter time. Interestingly, red-bellied woodpeckers were more of a Southern species. And in the past 20 years have really started moving North. I used to live in Southern Maine and one morning, a woke up and there are a whole bunch of birders on the road looking at the roof of my house. And they're all excited because it was a red-bellied woodpecker on the roof of my house. 
And it was a rare bird then to see a red-bellied woodpecker in Maine. Now, now it's pretty common. Um, so again, its range is expanding, um, probably because of bird feeding and, and uh, uh, climate getting a little warmer. Pileated woodpeckers are our largest woodpeckers and they sometimes will come to feeders. Really important bird because of their size, they make big holes in trees. And if you remember, I had mentioned the hooded merganser and how it's a duck that needs that nests in holes in trees. Wood ducks do the same thing. Um, so there are these, some of these bigger birds that nest in holes in trees and pileated woodpeckers make large enough holes for that. And of course we have our black capped chickadee and our tufted titmouse, um, very common feeder birds. And I wanted to mention the chickadee and the titmouse because they're really important in what's called mixed flocks in the winter time. And so chickadees and titmice are very social birds and chickadees will all, almost always be talking to each other in a small flock. Um, you've probably heard of the chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee, and, and you, already, you just might hear dee 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 dee, and they're talking to each other. Titmice will do the same thing. And, and so because of that, other birds know they're around. Chickadees and titmice being the resident birds know where the food sources are. And so they'll make the rounds around an, a forest area and other birds will follow them. Birds like the white-breasted and red-breasted nuthatches will follow the chickadees and the titmice, as well as our woodpeckers, the downy woodpeckers and the hairy woodpeckers and other songbirds that will be overwintering like kinglets. So, if you're ever out birding in the wintertime in the forest, or maybe you're just taking a hike in the forest and you hear chickadees, stop and take a look because it might not just be chickadees, there might be other birds following them to find where their food sources are. Nut hatches, I already mentioned the white-breasted nut hatch that had stored food in my stone wall. And red-breasted nut hatches are a little smaller and they're um, an eruptive species. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, we have sparrows. This is an American tree sparrow will come to feeders. It's a short distance migrant. It comes from Canada and here in Massachusetts, this is its, its wintering ground. So it's not very cold to this bird here. And white-throated sparrows, we mentioned before, and our finches. So we have on the left is a female house finch. On the right is a female purple finch. Hard to tell apart, but if you look at the purple finch, more of a face pattern, a big uh, dark splotch through the eye. Um, this bird is very plain on its face. Purple finches are also an eruptive species, which I wanted to mention again, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a sec. And gold finches, of course, will come to feeders. Notice the coloration of this bird, dull olive green, yellowish. Sometimes they're just gray. And so they're not gonna have that brilliant color that they have in the summertime because they're not in their breeding plumage. Something to keep in mind when you see winter birds. Eruption happens with certain birds, the red-breasted nuthatch, finches, such as pine siskins, the evening grosbeaks, um, crossbills, um, some jays and owls. So what happens with finches, nuthatches and jays, like this uh, evening grosbeak or a pine grows speak, is that they are up in the boreal forest with all those spruce trees and they eat the spruce seeds, but not all years are good years with spruce seeds. So when it's a bad year and there's not a lot of spruce seeds, they fly south and that's called an eruption. And they fly south and come to um, places like Massachusetts because they want to take advantage or search for food, they can't stay north. There's no food for them. Snowy owls are also an eruptive species, but for a opposite reason. What happens up in the tundra is the snowy owls will be feeding on lemmings. There, are, that's a rodent. If there's a huge population of lemmings, then the snowy owls are really successful in their breeding. They have many young, and the young will fledge and there's too many owls around and so they'll go south and that's an eruptive year. So actually the snowy owls, when there's so much food, 
is when they will come south and we will see them. And we always have a few surprises of birds too that uh, people don't think of as uh, staying in the wintertime. Robins and Eastern bluebirds will stay year round. Um, so, and there's always a few birds that you don't expect. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers might stick around as well as red-winged blackbirds. Just about four days ago, I saw about, oh, I don't know, it must've been a thousand red-winged blackbirds and they normally have gone south by now. Um, but sometimes they're just, it's been a warm November. Maybe they can find their food source. Maybe there's been more seeds. Um, it's hard, hard to say, but there's always surprises or birds will come further south from being up in Northern New England, like a Canada Jay. We know the trends of birds because of something called the Christmas bird count, which happens this time of year, where it's the longest, or I think it's the oldest citizen science project in our country. It's been running for over a hundred years where people go out in the wintertime, a certain location, certain dates, and look for as uh, and count all the birds in that location. And then all that data has been stored by the National Audubon Society. And so then they can look for trends of birds. And again, so how, uh, how do we know that? Things like the Christmas bird count and things like eBird, this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, eBird.org. I highly recommend if you like birds, you can go to this website, you can type in any bird um, and you can find out all sorts of data about where the bird's been seen. Um, bar charts, for example, I showed you the yellow warbler of when it expected to migrate. Um, so this is one of, I think it is the largest wildlife citizen science database in the world. So anyone who's going out and doing a checklist can put them into eBird from all over the world. So there's millions and millions of data points. And this is what scientists are using to find out what trends are happening. And then you can develop maps like BirdCast. This is a fun one where you can see what is happening in bird migration. And again, this is how scientists are tracking what's going on with bird trends. And just quickly, because I'm running out of time, I just want to show you this. <laughs> it's overwhelming when you talk about bird feeding. And so um, I just wanted to say that if you love to get into the minute details, you can look up on the internet what to feed birds and you can find hundreds of different charts of what birds will eat, what types of seeds and prefer what types of feeders. I personally, I just use suet and black oil sunflower seed. There are many different types of feeders. Um, as you can see in this list, I think the feeder really depends on um, what your situation is. In, let's say you have a backyard and what your room in your backyard, how it will be. Do you need a tube feeder or do you need a platform feeder? Um, do you want to attract um, more goldfinches, which would be a thistle feeder. So it all depends. Squirrel proofing, um, I don't think anything's 100% squirrel proof. And again, it depends on how you're setting up your bird feeding station. How many baffles do you have? How far away it is from a shrub so this, the squirrel can't leap onto the bird feeder. There's a whole bunch of supposedly squirrel proof feeders, but with all of these types of feeders, I have seen squirrels cling to the top and be able to get the food. They're really clever, clever little rodents um, and they're hungry too. And that's why they're determined to get to that easy, easy food. So it's just a matter of tweaking and trying different things. Um, anyway, I think what I'll do is I will end there because I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, just let me know. Yeah, I want to encourage people to just go ahead and unmute and ask any questions that you might have for Laura. Um, I know there's a lot of information. 
So while while the audience is thinking up their questions, I have a quick question on your list of deterrents to squirrels. I think it said candy canes. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, you, you read all this stuff like if you uh, crunch up candy canes and add it into your seed that they don't like peppermint, the smell of peppermint. I don't know if that works. It's not gonna harm the bird. The birds, birds, songbirds don't have a sense of smell. Um, the birds that have a sense of smell are things like vulture, turkey vultures do. Um, but so, yeah. But um, what about the what about the birds eating it though? If they get some of the pieces of the candy cane though, as far as their digestive, it doesn't bother them. I guess so. Yeah, I said crunch. I didn't mean small yeah. pieces, but you can oh, have okay. large pieces out. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, break yeah. them. I guess I should say break them into small Oh, break pieces. those. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Them. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah not, no, that's okay. All right. Yeah. Someone's asking about bears, it looks like. Hmm. Um, when is it safe to put bird feeders out? Each year, it's changing quite a bit. Um, I live actually in Northampton, which I think in Massachusetts as the highest bear population. It's a big problem. Um, I just put my feeders out uh, just this week and then I'll probably bring them in end of February. So it's not a long season. Uh, so I imagine it's probably could be a little, you could have put it out a little sooner in the Berkshires, but it's been a really warm November and bears are not true hibernators. Uh, meaning that they, you know, if it's warm enough, they can wake up and start foraging. Um, I do bring my feeders in at night. And so um, that's how I try to deter bears is I have a very short, you know, it's really December, January, February. So that when my bird feeders are out and then from that point on, I won't put any, I don't even put hummingbird feeders out um, because I've seen a bear in my yard several times. Well, if there's no more questions, Laura, I'd like to thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Great. Very informative. Um, of course, the beautiful photography is, is really stunning as well. Um, and if anyone has a final question for Laura, we have about a minute left. Enjoy your birding. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. And thank you everyone for coming. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Take care.